This is Jane, your AI-created announcer. Welcome back to AMC Presents. Today, I'm thrilled to host a conversation between AMC's creator, William Ford, and renowned composer, Stacey Garrup. <laughs> Ms. Garrup is a freelance composer in the Chicago area. Her catalog includes works for orchestra, opera, oratorio, wind ensemble, choir, art song, chamber ensembles, and solo instruments. Stacey Garrup's music focuses on dramatic and lyrical storytelling. She believes that sharing stories defines our humanity. We aim to share what we find compelling with others. She takes audiences on sonic journeys, some simple and beautiful, others complex and dark, based on the story's needs and drama. Dr. Garrup has received many awards and grants, including an Arts and Letters Award in Music from the American Academy of Arts and Letters, a Fromm Music Foundation grant, and the Barlow Prize. She has also been honored with three Barlow Endowment Commissions and prizes from various competitions. Major orchestras across the country have commissioned her work. Stacy earned degrees in music composition at the University of Michigan Ann Arbor, BM, University of Chicago, MA, and Indiana University Bloomington, DM. She taught composition and orchestration full-time at Roosevelt University from 2000 to 2016 before leaving to launch her freelance career. She is a Sadie Records recording artist. William will be exploring with Miss Garrup her background, influences, composing methods and style, and her views about music. Please remember to like, subscribe, and turn on notifications. This is a wonderful way for you to help our channel reach a wider audience. Also, you can become a patron of this channel at www.patreon.com forward slash Atlanta Music Critic. By doing so, you can help AMC continue to grow and provide first-rate interviews, reviews, and diaries. Now, here's William Ford in conversation with Stacey Garrop. It's great to see you. It's great to finally have a chance to meet you. I've been trying ever since I heard um, Burko's Journey. Oh, that's right. The Omaha Symphony. And actually, I did hear it on KVNO, which happens to be my favorite classical music station. Uh -huh. um, I was but immediately struck that the music was so accessible. I listened to it one time and I got it. And I didn't say to myself, I want a second opportunity in order to understand it. Rather, I wanted a second opportunity to enjoy it. A great compliment to you. But you're in... Evanston, Illinois, which is right above Chicago. To begin with, where were you born? I was born in the Midwest. But when I was about two years old, my parents moved to California. So I grew up in the Bay Area and I was there until I was 18. And then I went to actually back to the Midwest for all my training in composition. Do you specifically remember the years, probably not, that you were in the Midwest in your early life? I remember nothing because we moved when I was two. The earliest memories I can recall, actually, I think I was in my aunt's house at that point, I, my first memories. And that was on a visit of some sort because the house was not the same house that we eventually, that the layout of the house in California. But I was in California then for really the next 16 years until I realized I was going to be a composer and I needed to get to a school with a formidable composition program and music school around it to support me learning how to write for all the different groups and all that. When you lived in the Bay Area, what was it like for you? Well, I wish I had been a little more aware that I was going to be a composer because uh, those were the years that Kronos Quartet and Chanticleer were both getting on the ground, you know, getting their operations together and starting to do what they do. If I had known that I, what I was going to basically turn into, I would have loved to have seen them grow up more in a sense. But as it was, I still was able through my elementary, middle and high schools to be in different musical things. I was singing in choirs ever since third grade. There would be a year off here or there, but then I, I continued that all the way through my undergrad program. And I played piano starting at the age of five. <laughs> I ended up playing saxophone and marching band in high school. And when I, I think I, I played bells the first year, orchestral bells, which were extremely heavy to carry around on a, on a field. And I realized, and I'm a petite frame, and it was just really weighing, literally weighing me down. So I ended up taking up the saxophone the next summer. And it was in my, I think my junior year of high school that the band instructor also taught a music theory class. And I took the music theory class and he said, go home and write a piece of music. And that was our homework that night. And if he hadn't said that, we would not be on this call. All right. 
an influential person. Once I wrote that first piece, it's like I my mind opened up this new door I'd never known was there. And I walked into a room and the light was on and I could do all this stuff. And then I couldn't find the light switch to turn it off. And I just kept writing piece after piece after piece. Luckily, I was able to study with a Bay Area composer. He's no longer with us. He, he passed away a number of years ago, but he really got me moving very quickly through learning all the stuff that I'd never really learned before, all the composers that I had never studied. And he gave me a nice regimented schedule for learning everybody. So that that really helped. And then I from there, I went on to University of Michigan for my undergrad. How did your peers react to your interest in music? Back in high school, there were a couple other people interested in composing. So it seemed, I mean, at the time, I had just never really thought about composing before. And then when I started writing, I would get my saxophone buddies to write read through pieces with me and I think I, I knew already I was a better composer than saxophonist back then but they humored me and we read through it and that got me more yeah. excited than playing the saxophone or the piano or singing and honestly I don't know what I would have done if I had not gone into composing but the thing about me is I've never really cared that's a funny way to say it but it's like I know a lot of people feel like there's peer pressure to fit in and all that and I've never really felt that I feel like I need to just listen to my own drum and so I don't know if people thought I was doing something ludicrous all those years. I just know I would ask people to do things like to read through my saxophone quartet or play this piece for me that I just wrote and they would do it. And what about your parents? Were they musically inclined? No, my mother liked to be in local theater productions and my sister did too. But quite honestly, my sister got the nice voice and I did not, but I got all the technique in the world that she didn't get. I, I got the technique that you could study and learn and she didn't care to learn it. So if you put us together, I always believed we'd make a heck of a, sing, a singer, but you know, we're two separate people, but I would be able to get in any choir I wanted to because I had the technical ability to, to do all that. I just didn't have a great voice. I had a voice that would be the glue for everyone else put together. But no, I, I seem to have come out of left field. It sounds like you were very self-directed. After getting some direction from an important mentor, you pretty much took it and ran with it. Well, he yeah, this was H. David Hogan. Um, he certainly got me on the, um, on the right path. This, you know, here's the people you need to start to learn about and here are techniques to try out. Then I went to the Walden School for Young Composers, which was in New Hampshire. It's still operating. He was one of the founding members. So he sent me to that camp for two years, I think after my junior and senior years. So right away, once we figured out that I really was going strong with composing and that helped accelerate the experience and just kind of confirm that, yeah, that, that is what I want to be doing with my life. When you learned about other composers as you were maturing, have you identified some that you really like? At that point, what he was sharing with me were people like Messian and Schoenberg and um, Boulez, a lot of people that were, quite frankly, really far out there, because I think he knew that all we, I was getting in a public school system were very tonal composers. And he wanted me to see there were other ways of composing very quickly. He would give me literally a stack of 10 CDs each week um, because we had CD players back then. It had just come out. It was a newfangled thing. This is back in the 80s. So it was really helpful to hear that many styles in a row, but I don't feel like I identified with many of them. Along the way, I began to figure out the people I most strongly identify with is uh, Shostakovich because of the way he formally thinks of works. I think form is the most important parameter. If you don't have that, it's very hard to write a piece that brings people along and has them have them understand where you are in a piece. And Berko's journey is a very good example of that. That's a very strict structure on, at the base level. So. If that's working strongly, then everything on the surface that people are paying attention to will flow very nicely. I also think that George Crumb is my true spirit animal. I never studied with him, um, but I feel like the way that he thought about color and form and big shapes, you know, he'll have a piece that's 40 minutes long. I feel more of a kinship with him than just about anybody else. Now, because form and structure are important to you, are you the kind of person that goes out to eat and as an inspiration and has to write something down in a notebook in order to take it home and develop it? Not really. The way that I work 
is that I, when I get a commission, let's say um, I had a piece that I wrote for the U.S. Navy Band. They wanted something for the American Bandmaster Association Conference. So I asked Kenneth Collins, who is the captain, to get on the phone with me, and he um, included one of the musicians from the Navy Band. And I asked what I ask every commissioner, which is, what is important to you and your organization and your community? Um, so that's the question. And they responded, well, we have, we put humans uh, in expeditionary forces to places where humanity isn't supposed to survive. So they go well under the water and in submarines, they also protect the oceans from pirates and other things. And then they also go way up into, into the air and some of their people go into Na the NASA program eventually too. And they're, they're also Top Gun. So the Navy is Top Gun, not Air, you know, Air Force. I, when I heard all that and they gave some other ideas too, I came up with a piece called Forged by the Sea which is actually their motto because once I saw it I couldn't unsee it it was like perfect every aspect of what the Navy does is touched by water whether or not they're actually on the water doing their profession but if you're in Top Gun you start on an aircraft carrier that's out in the middle of the ocean that's where the piece went and when you when I deliver in this way uh, finding out what's important to the commissioner they tend to really identify with it strongly with Burko's journey um, the conversation with the Omaha Symphony and KVNO radio was where we began and I asked the same question, what's important to you and your community? And they kept talking about immigration. And so I finally said, well, I've got an immigration story for you. This is where Omaha, Nebraska is where my own family immigrated to from Ukraine. So it was it was a really good way to tell that story and in a community that would identify with especially so many Eastern European Jews coming out of modern day Ukraine from and Russia in early 1900s to escape the pogroms. Would you say that most of your music then programmatic as opposed to absolute? Yeah, I mean, I feel like for me, form is strong because there's something happening that pulls you along. It, there has to be tension and relaxation. And so I feel like when you when I create a form, I have like ABA sections or whatever, tension and relaxation are all operating. And that tends to work best if there's a story that goes along with it. Whether or not the audience knows the story isn't maybe as important. I do have pieces where I don't give any hint of what the, the story is. Like I have a piece called Fermenti and it's Italian for fragments. And each movement name is just primo, secondo. So you have no idea what the story is. But yet there's still story operating. It just is not something that I thought, I thought it would be better for the audience just to take it in as absolute music. I think if you don't understand what the tension and relaxation is doing in a piece, then you're in trouble. I, even if, it is, if it's a decision that I want this piece to be absolutely calm, it's gonna be six minutes of calmness, that's a decision that the composer is making. And once you make that decision, I'm fine with that. But if you're letting the piece meander and you don't, if the music is controlling you rather than you controlling the music, I firmly believe the audience picks up on that. So when you have the blank music page in front of you and you start with a note, does it organically grow from there for you? Or do you have some overall concept that guides you? I never start with the music. I start with the formal structure. So what I do is I create basically a chart that has tension on the y-axis and time on the x-axis. And once I, as I figure out what that story is, I begin to fill out the chart. So if tensions up, times cross, and I have like an A, B, A piece, I might be graphing out that the tension's gonna rise through the A and B section and then release in the, in the final A. But before I do that, I have to know the story. So with the Burko journey, Burko's journey piece, I knew that the first movement was about Burko leaving his village and having to go to the train station. So I wanted something that would really be an ABA that would grow in intensity up through the final A section, the second A section, to show his, his sadness for leaving this village and then it would have a fast decay. So once I understood that story, I graphed it out. And then once I had that, then I could start to write the music. Do you use any software to assist you in writing? Um, yeah, Sibelius comes in handy um, at some point. I always, though, begin with these graphs uh, and pencil and paper sketches because um, when I began composing, we didn't have these computer programs yet. So I'm always more in my comfort zone if I, I have these big sheets of um, 11 by 17 paper that I've used for decades. I just use that to start handwriting out my ideas. At some point, I will move over to the computer once I understand the form of what I'm going for and the materials that I'm using, because frankly, it saves time. If I know what I'm doing anyway, there's no point in handwriting it out and then putting it all back into the computer as well.
One of the things that sticks out in your bio, of course, is that you're freelance. There are not many composers who can say they're freelance. Yeah. Because you've got to make a living. And usually composers have, at least the ones that I've interviewed, usually have a second job mm -hmm. in order to make life affordable. So I take it you're to the point where you get enough commissions that that works for you. Yeah, I was a professor, a tenured professor for 16 years um, at Roosevelt University in downtown Chicago. So that helped me to save up a little bit for me to get the ball rolling with when I went freelance. Um, I knew that I could survive for a little, little bit of time without having to worry about um, any extra income. I, I also started immediately, once I knew I was going to quit, this was eight years ago, but I knew that I would have a certain amount of time to work and get things going. I jumped on the phone, called everybody who'd ever want to work with me and said, okay, now's the time, let's get something together. So within about six months, I had, and I had established enough to get things rolling. I also worked part-time at Roosevelt for an extra year before I completely left. And I also did some outreach stuff with Fifth, uh, Fifth House Ensemble. And then I got the residency uh, for an orchestra program through the League of American Orchestras and New Music USA. And then shortly after that, I got the residency gig for Chicago Opera Theater with their composer training program. So by the time you put all those different pieces together, I had an income coming in from enough different places that I was able to string things together. And it wasn't till the pandemic that that was four years into me being a freelancer, I realized, oh, I really have been doing well. I had been, everything was actually working as, as it really should be. And I hadn't had, I kept joking, I'd always have to go work at Subway at some point or Starbucks. And um, I've never, I've not had to do that yet. So <laughs> it's not to say that maybe things won't change in the future, but I'd like to think that I can still avoid working at Starbucks or, or Subway for a good long time. Many composers simply can't do that either because they don't have the business acumen, but more important, they may not be writing music that attracts commission in the same way that yours does. Is that fair to say? Well, that was one of the considerations when I was quitting my job. I remember my one of my colleagues saying, can you make money off of being a freelance composer? And <laughs> my answer was, well, I hope so. But the truth is I knew that my music is not that academic. It has always been more something that will appeal to a, a wider uh, section of the population. Uh, I knew by the point I quit that um, performers, especially saxophonists, have been playing my stuff for decades and that there was a, a good interest there. But I also knew that if I didn't take a chance on myself, I was gonna regret it for the rest of my life. And at some point that mattered more to me than anything else. I, I saw all these freelance composers, not a lot. I mean, as you say, there's not that many that can do this, but I saw several that were going out and getting really big opportunities and I couldn't be mad at them if I wasn't willing to take the same risks that they are. You mentioned that your music is not academic. Can you talk about that a little bit more? Basically, I'm asking, what's the academic that you're reacting to or even against. There are composers for, for whom their languages is, are, their language is more thorny or they're dealing with 12 tone rows. They're dealing with things that are not so lyrical or tonal. And that for, for me, I mean, there's plenty of people in academia who are, but I am, in looking at the ones at a number of institutions, I don't really fit in. And that's part of that whole thing back in school where I, I haven't ever actually cared if people think I'm doing the right thing or not, or, you know, but I just know I have to follow my own drum. It's the same thing. Um, I was thrilled to be teaching for as long as I, I was, but I also was even conscious there that my music didn't really fit um, in a lot of what people were writing in the, in the Chicago area even. I mean, you're one of the few composers that I've met who isn't struck with the here at one time and that's it. So many new music composers get one performance and then you move on uh, to other things. Yours seems to be repeatedly played. As I looked at your upcoming schedule, there are plenty of performances coming up of your music. Jennifer Higdon, Higdon's another person who can do that, mm -hmm. but there are not many. No, I, I think 
It's not every piece of mind that happens with two. Orchestra is notoriously difficult to get that second performance. And that's still proving to be true. I have plenty of pieces that have gotten their premiere and they were played well on by great orchestras. And then it's really hard to get another group interested. There are a couple pieces though, that like the battle for the ballot is one of them that is about um, the suffragists and voting rights issues. And because it's about voting rights, it keeps coming up. Um, I have versions for chamber orchestra. Um, it was born during the pandemic and Marin Alsop wanted to program it with Baltimore and Chicago symphony orchestras during the summer season. But we had to, de to determine how many people could fit on that stage, you know, with the safe distancing and everything. So there's a chamber version, there's the full version, and then a wind ensemble conductor, Donald McKinney, commissioned me to make a wind ensemble version. So there's three different versions of this piece running around, and it keeps getting programmed as a result. And I couldn't be more thrilled because it gets people talking about, about voting rights. And we still, to this day, in this country, struggle to make sure that everybody can have the right to vote. So it's something that I think is important. And that is one of my goals as a composer. And one of the reasons I am glad I went freelance is it allows me the time to tackle the issues in pieces that I really do feel like it's important. Yes, I, want, I always want to work with commissioners and find something that's important to them in their community that I can then write about. But I also have my own list <laughs> of topics that I want to be getting through. So as I'm working with potential commissioners, I'll see if they might be open to something that corresponds to an item on my list. If it had have been titled something other than showing a connection to voting rights, do you think the music would have been played repeatedly? There's a narrator. <laughs> so there's seven, seven suffragists um, quotes by them are being um, narrated throughout the entire piece. So in that case, I would say, yes, it's still, it's always going to be tied to voting rights. Could the title of a piece of music have such sway that it would affect how often it's played? I don't know. That's a good question. It depends. I have a piece right now that it was commissioned by the, uh, a resident in Highland Park, Illinois, in response to the mass shooting that happened on July 4th, 2022, during their parade. And it's called Repair the World. And um, it's it all stems from um, one of the tags somebody wrote for the victims that had uh, Tikkun Olam written in Hebrew and then Repair the World written in English below it. And that um, that idea got me thinking, wouldn't it be great if, if, I, if I named the title Repair the World, but then invited people to name it in to re to use that uh, Repair the World in whatever language is most comfortable to them and put that in program booklets and everything. That piece, I think, does have some staying power because of that title. But who knows? Um, I have another, I think part of the, really the truth of it is you have to create enough versions that maybe people will then come across and be able to program. Uh, for instance, during the pandemic, I, when I realized, you know, what I, the first question that came up for me is what good is a composer in a pandemic? That was like day one <laughs> of the pandemic. By day 14, I was contacted by a saxophone um, studio, uh, a professor who said I never got to play a, a final concert with my kids. Can you take you've always talked about taking some of your choir music and moving it over to saxophones. Can you do something like that for us? And that's when I realized, aha, this is what I can do. So I began making arrangements of a couple pieces. One piece in particular is called The Solitude of Stars, and there's over 20 versions of it now because that's how many people were asking me during the pandemic for a version. And I'm actually going to a performance this afternoon of it. I don't know which version it is. So I'm going to walk in and find out when they, <laughs> when they perform it. And so I think there's something beautiful to that, to find a piece in your own repertoire that is that elastic, that it can be reorchestrated in different ways. And I'm doing that with Repair the World right now. I'm up to 12 versions so far, and I know there'll be more in the future. Repair the World is one of the most exquisitely beautiful pieces of music. It really oh. is. And I, and I commend you for it. It's right up there with uh, the barber, Adagio for Strings. It's truly wonderful. Oh, thank you. I, but that one is proving to be not just elastic in orchestration, but in the way people perform it. It's it's really surprising me. Desiree Roostrat uh, played it. She wanted a version for solo violin, and that version works just as well as the piano trio version or the saxophone version. I now have the saxophone quartet version. It's curious when you find a piece that can stretch time-wise during its 
performance. I've not actually had that happen before, but Repair the World is the first piece like that. Sadie Records did release the digital version of it, which is the Lincoln Trio. They did that. The video of them on um, YouTube is from the premiere, the July 2nd, 2023 premiere. And then by November of 2023, we went into the studio and recorded that in about, I think it was under an hour. And they just, they knew the piece so well at that point. They'd been playing it so many times that it was just incredible what they did in the studio. Again, to step back and looking at the bigger picture, is it your goal to make music that is attractive to the first time listener? Some people don't really care. They just compose the music and go forward. But it sounds to me like you want it to be accessible on first year. Is that a goal or does it just happen? I don't know if accessible is the right word. I mean, I know what you're getting at. And yes, the language tends to be more accessible than not. But I think my I know my goal is to reach audiences and get them to think about what the topic is. I had a performance with The Crossing over the weekend for um, a piece called In a House Besieged, which is with text by Lydia Davis. And it's all about the anxiety of aging. And it really, that one is not as easy to listen to. It's, yes, it's the counterpoint is very clean because I wanted to make sure the text came to the forefront. But there's a lot of dissonance in that. It is not a pretty piece at times because anxiety is not a pretty thing. But that's my point is I figure out what is the story I'm telling. And then I figure out what is the musical language that I need to tell that story. So there's certainly other moments of I have a string quartet number two. uh, The third movement of that one is about a man losing his mind. So at some point, it's just chaos for about a minute straight. Um, And you don't know what you're supposed to be listening to because all the counterpoint is overlapping in crazy ways. But that's the point is that someone's lost his mind. So that's where I'm, that's what I'm always trying to do with each piece is figure out what is that story, even if it's not a story the audience knows. And then how do I make sure that's clear to the audience? When Joanne Bernstein commissioned me for the piece, it really was about the Highland Park shooting um, on July 4th, 2022. But in light of the when the Israeli Hamas war began, I began getting requests from performers who were already playing it, if they could play Repair the World in context of um, these worldwide conflicts. And that's where Joanne and I talked and realized, yeah, this piece could be used in a a number of ways, whether it's a personal or um, a global issue whatever. So that has been interesting too. Not only is the music elastic and I've been reorchestrating it for different groups, but we've, and um, we've invited people in the program note to just go ahead and play it for whatever purpose they feel like they could, they could use this piece. How do you get the commissions? Do people come to you? Do you reach out to people? How does that work? I'm approached by groups. I, I, for a while used to um, um, apply to different commissioning funds or whatever, And at this point, very rarely do I do that. At most times, uh, people will come to me and say, okay, we'd like to apply for this grant together or that, or we've got funders together already. We'd like to commission you for this. So, um, yeah, I haven't, 
I'm also, my age has aged me out of most of every competition at this point. So that's fine. Um, but I, I just, or I'll, I'll help build consortium commissions. That's a very common thing in the wind ensemble world. So I've done a number of those already um, since I went freelance. And of course, consortium funding helps ensure that you're going to have several performances. Yeah, I have a piece called Alpenglow, which was a double concerto for saxophone, tuba, and wind ensemble. And that one, it was written to be not quite as difficult as the previous concerto I did, which was Quicksilver. And that was terribly difficult for saxophonists. So I, we wanted something that would be the more lyrical side, <laughs> the commissioners and I. And as a result, it's been played a ton. If you go on YouTube and put in the word Alpenglow, which is like glow on the mountains, um, and then my last name, you'll see a bunch of versions are popping up because these groups are all, so many of the con commissioned or the consortium members played it and now uh, it's out of exclusivity. So other groups are starting to play it as well. Do you ever go back after you've finished a piece and modify it because the performance say, performers say, eh, can't do it, or eh, not good, or anything like that? For the most part, if there's problems that come up in, in the rehearsal process, those are the things I want to address. And it tends to be, the more people on stage, the harder that can be. I'm finishing the revisions of a piece called Song of Orpheus that premiered with the Louisiana Philharmonic uh, Orchestra last year. And I realized in performance, a whole chunk would be better if I took the orchestration from earlier and just plopped it into a later section instead of reorchestrating it. That's a big, that's the biggest change I've had to make in a long time. Actually, it's just, okay, the trumpets, it's not quite getting the right tone color I'm looking for. I better change that note. But other than that, I haven't had to do a substantial rewrite in a long time. I have done opera. That's where that tends to happen more when maybe something's not functioning on the stage as we might want it and the librettist might want to change the wording, etc. It's just the small fixes at this point. I'm pretty happy with the piece by the time it gets to the stage. Do you ever have musicians who are skilled like at the violin, for example, review it before or, or get consultation from them with regard to sound or a technical issue? Yeah, so when I wrote In a House Besiege for the Crossing, it's for the crossing and an organ. And I've written a bit for the organ, but not a ton. So I wrote what I thought is my best guess at how to do it after studying lots of videos and lots of books, uh, videos of organists explaining their instruments and going through all the sounds and all that. So I uh, talked to my friend Stephen Alltop, who's an organist and a conductor. And we played through the organ, he played through the organ part and we explored the different colors of pipes. So I could at least get on the page what I thought would be the right pipes. And then I could take to Scott Detra who was recording it or performing it and recording it with the crossing. And then Scott helped me reshape a couple of choices from there. But yeah, I think if you don't know what you're doing as a composer with an instrument, the best thing you can do is, is talk to that performer. With harpists, I almost always get the harpist's email address ahead of time for an orchestra piece so I can run the harp part by them and make sure what I've done is um, really going to fit the hands because that's the instrument that I least know and I want to make sure I've done it right. It's been great talking with you. I really get a sense of who you are as a composer and your approach to composing. And that's a really great insight. I really appreciate it. Well, thank you, William, for talking. I will say it sounds like I, I really care so much about what that I connect with the audience. I just have never cared about playing by someone else's rules. I think it that has led to a lot of confidence. I When I used to teach, there would be so many students that would feel like uh, they were not confident or, or they would be procrastinating as a result. And I think the answer, the reason is because they were comparing themselves to all the people they were studying in music history and music theory, all these Finnish Beethoven symphonies or, you know, Boulez works. 
And I think the truth is everyone just needs to follow their own, their own internal guide. And, and if we haven't was... learned anything over the last five years in the United States, is that there are many ways to be many different things. Yeah. The culture wars, that seems to me what it's all about. So I applaud you for that. Well, thank you, William. This has been a great interview. I've enjoyed talking with you. I appreciate it. See you again. Okay. Okay, bye-bye. Bye. Wow, that was a great interview. William sure knows how to bring out the best in his interviewees. His insightful questions have helped me to get a much clearer picture of Stacey Garup and how she has become a standout composer. Let's hear it for both of them. As always, I urge you to like, subscribe, and ring that notification bell. That will help ensure that other classical music lovers will be able to get to know Stacy better. Also, be sure to become a patron at www.patreon.com forward slash Atlanta Music Critic. Your support at any level will help this channel grow in quality and reach. Please take a moment to help. Finally, we would like to hear from you. If you have suggestions, including about who you would like to see interviewed, please enter them in the comments below. And finally, a special thanks to Schumann Public Relations for making this interview possible. Christina Bianco and Lisa Jainig have been great supporters of AMC. Thanks again for watching. See you again soon. This is Jane signing off. Oi, 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 oi.